I want to do something a bit different today. Uh, we all have a lot of preparing to do for the holidays. Uh, I think we've got gifts to get and meals to plan and all of this. We've, we've all got a lot of preparation to do for the holidays. What I want to do today, if you'll let me, is I want to take kind of a giant step back and I want to spend some time getting us personally prepared. You can prepare everything else, but if you're not ready, it's not going to be all that it would be. And so I want to make sure that we get prepared ourselves. And I love the Christmas season, but how many of you have noticed at times in the Christmas season, stress can just kind of creep into our lives. It can come. Now, stress is not unique to Christmas. Stress comes all the year round, but uh, it's often heightened during this time of year, and it makes perfect sense. People that study these things let us know there are three primary causes for stress in our lives. There's time, there's money, and there are emotions. And we deal with all three of those in abundance during the Christmas season. Time. Man, we've all got places to go, things to do, the rush is on, and and that can bring stress into our lives. And then we think of uh, the, the needs that we have. We've got to get gifts and more groceries than normal. And then, of course, the exorbitant gas prices as we drive around to get all this stuff. And money's a massive source of stress in our lives. It's just a fact. And then there's the emotional side of it. You know, when we were kids, everything about Christmas was forward-looking. We just wanted to get to that day when we could get those gifts under that tree. And you live a little bit. And Christmas is also a time of reflecting. Now, people you've lost that you love and you'll miss this year, about some heartaches maybe you've had along the way. Uh, many times we can just look at the world during a season like this and think, man, what a mess uh, this, this planet of ours is in. And we can look back at Christmas and it can bring feelings of sadness for sure. Sometimes even just getting together with extended family can be stressful. How many of you have a family member who's a little bit nutty like I do? Yes. For those of you who didn't raise your hand, you're the nutty one. Just know that about yourself, all right? There's always stress that surrounds family, and uh, it works that way. So today I want to do my best to share some principles from God's Word that can prepare us for this season. It's kind of like a vaccine as we head into the Christmas season, except this one will keep you from getting overwhelmed by stress and will keep you from sharing stress with others, all right? So we're going to get into God's Word today, John chapter 8. If you're able, I'd like to invite you to join me in standing. John chapter 8. And to get us started, we'll read just one verse, many other verses in the course of our study today. John chapter 8. Hey, if you're glad to be here, say amen. Amen. I'm glad you're here. I've got to tell you, I've looked forward all week. I mean, each day of this week specifically, I've been excited to share this message with you. And uh, I'm glad you're here. We'll get in the Word. I'll do my best. I hope you'll do your best. And I've discovered in my Christian life, I tend to get out of a thing about what I put into it. So what do you say? Why don't we just put our hearts into this time in the Word today and try and get blessed along the way. John chapter 8, and I'm going to be reading in verse 12. The Bible says, Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. I want you to take note of the words just about dead center in that verse where Jesus said, He that followeth me. That's my prayer for each of us that through this Christmas season, we'd follow Jesus. He has so much to help us with and to teach us. Father, we thank you for this day. And again, I thank you for each person in this room. I pray that you would open our hearts to the truth of the Bible. May we learn, may we grow, may we live for you as a result of what we learned today. And we ask this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much. You may be seated. If you've ever felt stressed out during the holiday season, I want you to know this. You are not alone. In fact, if you study the narrative of Christmas in the Bible, you're going to discover that the first Christmas was completely a time of stress. Christmas was literally born out of stress. And just think of the Christmas story. Work through it in your mind. It it begins as angels just start popping up and scaring people. You say, Pastor, it doesn't say they scared people. It does too. The first things they said every time was, be not afraid. Don't be scared. They were scaring people. I'd probably be scared if an angel popped up in front of me, all right? And that's how the Christmas story begins. Angels start popping up. And then we know that Mary is pregnant and not yet married, stressful. Joseph's first reaction upon hearing about Mary was to end their relationship, and thankfully, 
he had a change of heart. The Bible tells us it was tax season, and nobody likes to pay taxes to a government that squanders and misuses your tax money. Amen. I'll just amen myself right there, all right? It was tax season, stressful. And, and then uh, how many of you have ever made a road trip with a pregnant woman? Well, Joseph had to make one with Mary, all right? And that can be stressful, but, but imagine there was no fast food, no rest stops, no air-conditioned cars. And then the birth of Jesus, or as I like to say it, the delivery in the livery, all right? The birth of Jesus, stressful time, no doubt. And then we see the shepherds, just some random guys show up uninvited. Mary's like, who's here? Who are they? We didn't invite them. And, and the shepherds show up. And on I could go, but I think you get the picture. And I would love to bring you a message today to tell you how you could avoid any stress in your life. Of course, I can't do that. No pastor can do that. But, but I want you to know I can bring a message today that will help us to handle stress in a way that will actually allow us to grow and to become stronger. What I can do with you today is share with you how Jesus dealt with stress and how by application we can as well. Now, some could think today, wait a minute, Pastor, you're going to tell us how Jesus dealt with it? Well, Jesus is perfect. I mean, Jesus is God, and I would say amen. You get an A-plus for theology when it comes to the deity of Jesus. He indeed is God. Jesus is all God and all man, all at the same time. God was born as a person, as a human, he was all God, is God, and all man, all at the same time. He endured everything life has to offer, including stress. In Hebrews 4, the Bible says, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Jesus had to be in one place at one time. He, he limited himself when he was living on earth. He would have known of the stress of time. He had emotions that needed to be kept in check. Jesus Christ, God the Son, knew what it was to be tired. He knew what it was to be hungry. He knew what it was in life to be hot and to be cold. And being God, he could have, in the course of his life, used the prerogatives of his deity to remove anything that resembled stress. But for the 33 years of his life, Jesus went through it all in large part to leave us a pattern so we could know how to live our lives. That's why Jesus could say in our text, I'm the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. The life of Jesus calls us to follow him. Jesus teaches us so much, but as it relates to the stress of the holiday season, what does Jesus teach us? Here's the first thought today. Number one, the power of of identification the power of identification simply put Jesus knew who he was there's none of this identification questioning he knew who he was he never wavered when it came to his identity now there are a, a number of great statements in the New Testament where Jesus is speaking and he would begin by saying I am we often just refer to these as the I am statements of Jesus in fact in our text that we read today we find one of these I am statements of Jesus here in John 8 and verse 12 Jesus said I am the light of the world in John 10, in verse 9, Jesus said, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. In John 10, in verse 11, Jesus said, I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. In John 14, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He said, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. And I love the way in John 10, in verse 36, Jesus said it this way. He simply said, I am the Son of God. And because Jesus knew who he was, he did not have to worry about the stress of trying to be what other people expected him to be. And we all feel that pressure at times in our lives. Jesus wasn't immune from that pressure. He loved the disciples, but the disciples wanted Jesus to be something other than who he was. They wanted him to be the king. They just couldn't wrap their minds around the fact that the Messiah came and he wasn't going to defeat Rome and change things. He, they, they said, you, you should be the king. And that's not what Jesus came to do the first time he came. Think of the religious leaders. They wanted Jesus not to be the son of God. 
But the power of identification kept him from bowing to those stressors in his life. Friends, this is common in all of life, but it's heightened at Christmas when we enter into a situation and we put on and we begin to act like something that we are not. Uh, we live life invariably then looking through a mask. It seems to shroud a bit of everything we do. And insecurity can lead to pressure to perform to the standard of another, to conform to the image that another has imposed upon you. And, and insecurity security is a cruel taskmaster we begin to have expectations and goals that we've received from others and it puts us in a position where no matter how much we work we just can't measure up because we're not running the race god has for us we're trying to live up to the expectations of another thankfully god's word has so much to say about the matter of identity for those that know the lord and if you know jesus today is your savior say amen. amen i'll tell you something i know about you who you are you're a child of God. You've been put on this earth for his purpose. You, you don't need to pray, God, what's, what, what's my purpose in life? He, he says, no, 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 I've got a purpose. You get plugged into what I'm doing. You, you've got a purpose in your life, and it's been put there by God. I want you to know today that you are loved, and you are accepted in the beloved, and when you are in Christ, you're always enough. I like how Paul said it in 2 Corinthians 3. He said, listen, it's not that we're sufficient of ourselves, to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. In Colossians, Paul put it this way. He said, Christ in you, the hope of glory. And if you're a Christian, you have Christ in you, and you are equipped to handle the stress that comes because of the identity that's been imprinted upon you by way of the good grace of God. Somebody say amen. amen. We know who we are. See, the power of identification, but then Jesus shows us next about the power of concentration. Something incredible happens in our lives when we trim things down to the simplest form. Concentrate can mean to think deeply upon, but concentrate can mean to just boil something down to its most essential ingredients. And specific to what we'll learn from Jesus, there is an incredible stress-busting effect that comes to our lives when we concentrate those we seek to please in our life to just one, and that one is God. Now, Jesus, he knew who he was. But more than that, he knew who he was to serve. He knew who he was aiming to please. Listen to how Jesus said it in John 5. He said, I can of mine own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which hath sent me. Jesus said, let me tell you what I'm doing in life. I'm seeking to do the will of the Father. I want to please the Father. And friends, this seems so simple. Pastor, really, is that all you got for us today? And I would say that's a tough lesson to learn in life. I remember when we started the church here, I sincerely, from the bottom of my heart, just wanted to be a pastor to people. I wanted to love people and serve people and be there for people. I wanted to be there in their good times, and I wanted to be there in their hard times. I never wanted to be an evangelist who travels around, nothing against those that do that. But I'm telling you, I just feel like God wired me to be a pastor. And as the church started, I was there for everybody's everything. I was going to Little League games for children in the church, and I was at every hospital for every visit. I was doing every counseling session. And as the church began to grow, and as, as my girls began to grow, I sensed this tension, and I thought, I just can't get there for everything and about burnt myself out trying to trying to do that for a while i had to realize two things i had to realize two things that would be good for all of us to realize first i can't please everybody no matter how hard i try how many of you think a pastor would rather pastor a church that is pleased with him than a church that is not pleased with him but every one of you have an opinion about everything we do. And I would go absolutely bananas, bonkers, nutty if I sought to please everybody. It's impossible. And I had to, I had to realize that. Second, I had to realize this. If you're still with me, say amen. amen. It's not my calling in life to please everyone. And it's not your calling in life to please everyone. 
personally, and I'll make application, but personally as a pastor, it, it's my job to teach the, uh, the, the, the church and to feed the proverbial flock so we can be built up and do the work of God. In Ephesians 4, Paul said it this way. He said, and he gave some apostles, uh, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting or the maturing of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Listen, there are going to be times in your life where you're going to be doing your best to do your best and somebody in the peanut gallery is going to look at you as you're doing your best to do your best and say you're doing it wrong. We need a little more of this from you and a little less of that from you and, and they're going to come into your life. There have been a lot of times I've thought what I'm about to say, but I've never said it in a conversation. But I've been cornered a few times over the years. And while people try to straighten me out about what it is I need to do, the thought in my mind is, boy, am I glad it's not my calling in life to please you. Because it would never happen, ever. You can't be pleased. You're unpleasable. Friends, listen. Because Jesus concentrated his life on pleasing God the Father instead of people, he accomplished his purpose his purpose it was concentrated on the will of the father in fact in the life of jesus christ there were two times when the voice of god the father was heard twice just twice in the life of jesus do we hear the voice of god the father and on each occasion listen to what god the father said in matthew 3 we read it this way he said this is my beloved son in whom i am well pleased what a great testimony from the father. By the way, if there are any dads in this room, there's not a child alive that doesn't want to hear from their dad, I love you and I'm pleased with you, all right? And, and that was the testimony of God the Father to God the Son. The apostle Paul, who accomplished so much for God, understood this too. To the church in Galatia, he wrote this. I love this, Galatians 1. He said, for do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? The idea is like, yeah, right, no, that, that's not what I'm about, all right? He said, for if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. In other words, he said, my goal in life is not to be a people pleaser. It's to please God, to do what God would have me to do. And this whole thing is heightened at Christmas. We feel the pressure to cook like Betty Crocker and to decorate like Clark Griswold. And we we'll want to be a light for others like Rudolph. And we end up looking like the family in Home Alone and we forget what's really important when we try to perform to the standards of others. Can I take some pressure off your plate this morning? Approach this season with a desire to serve Jesus Christ, to honor him, to glorify him. And what I have found is that as you do that, you'll invariably bless the most important people in your life. Concentrate, boil it down to Jesus. This is a philosophy I try to live by. And when I do, things go as they should. And when I don't, that stress comes. But some of you have heard me say, and it does bear repeating today, do what you do for God. But listen, you can't afford to have everybody in your life be a boss of sorts. Serve God. One. One. Colossians 3.19, the Bible says, Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. You see, I want to be a good husband. Why? Because I've decided I want to follow Jesus. I want to serve God. And it's God that tells me, Steve, be a good husband. Now, Lisa tells me that sometimes too, okay? But, but I, I want to do it because it's God that's saying it. If I follow God, guess what? I'll be a good husband. The Bible in Ephesians 6 says, And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. I don't want to be a helicopter parent. I don't I don't want to be a bulldozer parent. I want to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And if I follow Jesus, I'll bring children up in the ways of God. The pastors, 2 Timothy 4, the Bible says, preach the word. Everybody brings an expectation to church. Let me tell you what you should expect from a pastor. A man who begins each week saying something similar to, would you take your copy of God's word and join me in turning in someone who teaches and preaches the Bible. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. If I follow Jesus, you'll be blessed in the process. You'll be blessed if you live for Jesus. I think you'll even find that your boss or employees will be happy about that. Colossians 3, the Bible says, Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. 
You see, Jesus not only lived out his own life to provide us an example, he taught us this very clearly in his longest sermon called the Sermon on the Mount. He put it this way in Matthew 6, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Jesus said, let me simplify your life. You just need to boil it down to me, all right? And I'll take care of the rest. Those are words to live by. Then I'll share with you today, third, the power of organization. Jesus lived this out. Let me tell you, God does not function through chaos. He's a God of order. Everything he does is orderly. Now, I don't, I don't want to be rob robotic, but I, I want to have a degree of organization in the course of my life, in the course of our church. God is a God of order. He works through order. Jesus alluded to this in John 8 and verse 14, just a couple verses down from where we read earlier. He said, I, uh, Jesus answered and said unto them, though I bear record of myself, yet my record is true. For I know whence I came and whither I go, but ye cannot tell whence I came and whither I go. A lot happening in that verse, but one thing Jesus said is this. Hey, listen, I know where I've come from, I know where I am, and I know where I'm going. There's a process here, there's a scope, and there is a sequence. And friends, if you don't have priorities, you cannot develop a plan. And if you don't have a plan for the holidays, you cannot prepare for the holidays. And here's the rub, if you're listening, say amen. I'm going to help you here. Preparation prevents pressure. Preparation prevents pressure. Procrastination produces pressure. That's true for me. It's true for you. Preparation. It prevents pressure. Procrastination. It produces pressure. Now, this is clearly a different type of message, and I want to get super duper radically uh, 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 simple so that we can get these truths. I want to get practical. So if you want to enjoy the holiday season, say amen. amen. That wasn't good enough. <laughs> if you want to enjoy the holiday season, say amen. amen. We have to have our priorities lined out. And then we got to build a plan that will help us accomplish our priorities. And that will bring us to the place where we'll then prepare according to our plan that, Lord willing, will lead us to that which we have prioritized. One great thing you could do today, this day, to help you have a great Christmas season is to go home, get out a calendar. If you're married, get your spouse. And say, look, what is it that we want to get to this holiday season? Let's get that down. Let's get that on the calendar. All right? Get the calendar out. Determine what you want to do. Schedule it. You will either be led in your life by your priorities or by pressure. And when pressure leads the way, you're at the whim of whoever or whatever is pushing you. And that's a stressful way to live. Don't forget, as you think of your plan, include Jesus. It's his birthday after all. And I don't always get this right, but when I plan, I know things go much better in my life. Let's take a survey. All right? How many of you are getting a real tree this year? Amen. I see those hands. God bless you. God bless you. How many go on the fake route, huh? Oh, my goodness. I'm just glad Lisa's in the nursery this service. All right, she'd be taking names. All right, so, all right, some of you are going to go get a tree. Uh, uh, others of you are going to get it out of the attic or whatever, and you're going to put it up. Uh, however it works, I, I would just ask, this is a question you don't answer out loud. When? When are you going to do that? Now, I'm convicted today because we get our tree every year the Saturday after Thanksgiving. And uh, it took me longer than normal to get all the lights on the house yesterday. I didn't get to the tree. So thankfully, in your plan, I'll just ad lib here. Put margin in your plan, all right? Sometimes you don't get, uh, get everything done when you want, but, but plan it out. Plan it out. Uh, you, you'll be glad you did. You see, my prayer for you is that when you get to the end of the holiday season, you'll be able to say, I'm so glad we did, rather than, man, I wish we had. I want you to get to the end, having done it, according to your priorities, that you were able to build a plan around and you prepared you prepared. When you're done putting those big rocks, so to speak, on your calendar, I want you to get another piece of paper out, a fresh piece of paper, and prepare a budget. Much of the problem we have during the holidays pertains to finances, and there's a huge amount of pressure to overspend. 
Sometimes it's guilt for shortcomings in the, in, the, in the year that leads up to Christmas. Let me tell you this, friends. Your kids would rather have you without stress than tons of presents. And you so stressed out that parents are crabby with one another. And, and the kids, man, they can feel that. They can feel that. And uh, th th they'd rather have little with joy in the home. Determine that you won't spend irrationally during this season. Say, Pastor, what are you trying to do today? This is called pastoring. This is pastoring. Determine. Don't spend irrationally this season. Let me share with you what Solomon said. Proverbs chapter 10, he said, He becometh poor that dealeth with a slack hand. Let me define slack hand. The spending was not prepared. Another way of saying that is there was no budget. Say, well, I'm not poor. Okay, well, Solomon said you're going to become poor if you live that way. Take some time. Plan it out. He said, but the hand of the diligent maketh rich. And again, the idea of rich, it's like, wow, I can get a jet. No, no, rich just means we, we have what we need to care for uh, the needs in our lives. That hinders our ability in life. It hinders our ability to give to the Lord. It adds undue stress to uh, our relationships. The holidays are stressful, but friends, when the charged cards get fired up, that stress goes to a whole new level. There are many stresses in the holidays. Getting together with the in-laws. Can I get an amen there? Yeah, good. Some of you mumbled that. Hey, wait, he said it extra loud. That's my son-in-law. He can't say that. In-laws, that can be a source of stress. The malls. I drove by an outlet mall yesterday, and I just, I got anxiety just looking at it. I thought, holy moly, I'm gonna have to go to one of those one of these days. Buying something for my wife. Now, I love my wife with all my heart, and I think I'm generous, but man, I've, I've got her some gifts before. I was so excited for it opening, and I could just tell, oh, I bombed again, you know, so I got this stress. I've got to get that right. We have the in-laws. Can I get a name in there? Malls. I know I mentioned those. They just bear repeating, all right? We got to know where the source of our stress can be. I could go on and on. Don't add the burden of entering into the new year with unneeded debt. Your kids will break the toys before you've paid the bill. That's a stressful way to live. When our girls were growing up, I'd a lot of times video them later in the day on Christmas, and I'd, I'd ask them what was the best part of Christmas this year. And uh, I, I have a little video from Julie. I should have showed it today. I said, Julie, what was the best part of Christmas? She said, I got Uno, and you played it with me. And when she said that, it just hit me like a ton of bricks. Had I known that, do you know how much money I could have saved that year, you know? <laughs> I played with her. What was the best part of Christmas? Dad, you played with me. You gave me your time. You focused on me. You looked me in the eyes. Now, I know someone's thinking this is pretty simplistic. Here's what I'll tell you. This is my 26th year to lead our church through Christmas. And I sincerely love you with a pastor's heart. And I've seen the pitfalls. And I don't want that for you. And God does not want that for you. Keep Jesus first and everything else will fall into order. You see, Jesus has given all of us a great Christmas present already this year. It's the gift of his example. Peter said it this way in 1 Peter 2. He said, For even hereunto were you called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. Jesus did exactly and entirely what the Father had for him to do. Why? Because of identification, the power of identification. He knew who he was. Identification. Because of the power of concentration, he was able to put all that noise aside and focus clearly on the will of the Father and through the power of organization. When he knew who he was and where it was he was going, he could build the plan around that. And friends, you could do the same. I get a kick out of this story. It took place in December of 1903. After many attempts, the Wright brothers were successful in getting their flying machine off the ground, and they were so excited, they telegraphed to their sister, Catherine. Here's what they wrote. We have actually flown 120 feet. We'll be home for Christmas. 
Well, Catherine was excited by, by that. So she went to the, to the newspaper and she wanted to share this news. And, and the editor of the newspaper looked down at the telegraph and here's what he said. He said, how nice. The boys will be home for Christmas. He missed the big news. Man had flown. Granted, it was only a 120-foot flight, but it was the first time man had taken flight. He, he missed the big news. And I'm saying to you today, how sad would it be if we missed the real meaning of this time of year because we let the stress of it all get the better of us? My prayer for you today is that as individuals and as families and as a church, that we would keep the reason for it all in our hearts. Cliche, I know, but my prayer is that we'll keep Christ in our Christmas and that we'll live it for Him. Our Father, we're thankful that you give us so much wisdom in your word. God, at times it's just flat out embarrassing how many things I endure, I go through that they didn't have to be stressors in my life. Had I followed your guidance, it would have been avoided. And Lord, I pray that you'd help us today. We're a month out. Help us, Lord, to have some thoughts today that would help the rest of this season to be all that it would be. May we live it for your glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Thank you for watching today's service. It's our prayer, whether you're a friend near or far, that today's services were a help and encouragement to you. If you'd like to get more connected with us, stop by our website, or maybe you have a prayer request or a question that we can help you with, feel free to drop us an email. Again, these services are designed to help you encourage and grow in your faith in Jesus Christ. If we can ever do anything for you, please let us know. And it's our prayer that we'll get to worship with you again soon.